Hey everyone and welcome to Politics and Prose Live. Thank you so much for joining us in this new format where we can continue to bring authors and their new books to the community. As this is a new venture, please bear with us as we work out all the kinks and get comfortable with this new platform. At any time during the event, you can click on the green button below to purchase tonight's book on Politics and Prose's website. We're currently offering free media mail shipping on all domestic orders. And every purchase goes to support our small business at a time when we truly need it the most. Also, you can ask the author a question at any time by clicking on the Ask a Question button below, which is uh, at the bottom of the screen, as I said. You can submit a question there. Um, you can also uh, read other people's questions and even upvote uh, questions that you'd most like to hear answered. Also, just a reminder that the author, the host, and the audience members cannot see you uh, through the screen, so feel free to relax and be comfortable. And finally, uh, we want to thank you so much for being here. It's um, small businesses like Politics and Pros that especially need your support in times like these. And so without any further ado, we are very pleased to welcome Christopher James Bonner to Politics and Pros Live. He is an assistant professor at the University of Maryland focusing on African-American history in the 19th century United States. His illuminating study of citizenship from the Constitution's vague definition of the term charts the myriad ways that Blacks in the antebellum free states use that ambiguity to claim certain specific rights and protections and help shape the development of the citizen status. Here to explain further is Christopher James Bonner. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, well, this is about the time that I would say it's good to see you, but uh, unfortunately, I can't, but I'll say it's good to be seen. Um, so I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join the stream. And I really want to thank the organizers from Politics and Prose uh, for doing this in this format. It's, it's a really great chance for me to be able to uh, talk with a lot of family and friends, and so uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm excited for this chance to talk about my new book, which is called Remaking the Republic. In the next 30 minutes or so, I'll outline some of the big ideas that are driving the book. I'll tell a story about some of the forms of Black politics that I explore in the project, and I'll offer some thoughts about how this book might encourage different ways of thinking about some aspects of contemporary Black politics. So my title today, as you see, is Runaways or Citizens Claimed as Such. I'll start with a question. What does citizenship mean to you? What does it mean to say a person is a citizen? Typically, when I ask these questions, I get a wide range of answers. People might talk about specific rights that citizenship confers. They might mention broader benefits of the status, things like access to the law, or access to the physical territory claimed by a national government. They might talk about intangible things like belonging. If I'm a citizen, then I belong in this country, and in a way, the country belongs to me. It's important that there are so many different ways to approach this question. Citizenship remains contested ground. Some people are working to claim particular rights or protections as citizens, while others are working to deny the status to particular groups and restrict access to its benefits. It's also important that even if people don't agree on what exactly citizenship means, they tend to have strong ideas about it. People do seem to agree that citizenship is a significant marker of a person's legal identity, that it offers tangible and intangible benefits and protections. People generally agree that citizenship is a thing worth fighting for. So none of these qualities of citizenship are new. Since the nation's earliest decades, people have disagreed about the precise terms of citizenship, but many have felt that it was, it was an important status. It was a thing that was worth fighting for. My book tells a series of stories about Black Americans pushing their way into that fight in the early 19th century. I write about free Black people who made claims about what citizenship meant in hopes of changing the legal terms of their lives in the United States. In their words and actions, black people, made, black people made radical arguments about citizenship, and they did critical work to shape the nation's legal development, even as those in positions of power denied them a voice in the lawmaking process. To offer a little context about black life in the early 19th century, in the aftermath of the American Revolution, several Northern states took steps to gradually abolish slavery. New York's gradual abolition law, which you see part of here, said that enslaved people born after July 4th, 1799 would be free once they reached age 25 for women or 28 
for men. So people would live in slavery or, or in a state of bondage uh, until they reach that age. And, and this is a sort of uh, a very partial emancipation law, right? Not only was it gradual, but someone who would have been born on July 3rd, 1799, could theoretically be enslaved for their entire life. These kinds of laws slowly created a free black population in the Northern states. But at the same time, lawmakers enacted measures that limited black freedom in profound ways. The US Congress excluded black men from the military and many states similarly barred black men from militias. Ohio required free black people to put up a $500 bond before they could settle in the state. New York said black men could only vote if they owned $250 worth of real estate, and this is about $10,000 in current money. Faced with these restrictions, black people turned to citizenship in pursuit of justice. The word citizen appeared 11 times in the original US Constitution. And so here you can see some of its uses. It's a qualification for the presidency. Uh, it's a status that protects an undefined but apparently important set of privileges and immunities. The document, the US Constitution implied that citizenship could be an important factor in determining a person's legal life, but it didn't name the rights or obligations of the status. It also didn't say who could be a citizen. And this uncertainty persisted beyond the earliest years of the country. As late as 1862, US Attorney General Edward Bates said, 80 years of practical enjoyment of citizenship under the Constitution have not sufficed to teach us either the exact meaning of the word or the constituent elements of the thing we prize so highly. So this uncertainty was powerful for black activists. No law said African-Americans could not be citizens. So black people insisted that they were, and they demanded legal protections under the status. Citizenship became a flexible and potent tool. And when black activists claimed rights as citizens, they contributed to ongoing conversations about the relationships among individuals and governments in the US. And so this is the process that I'm referring to in the book's title. Black folks were remaking the Republic. They were doing work that could change the legal foundations of the United States. And it's really important that these foundations were in flux uh, for the first several decades of the country. One of the first things that comes to mind for many people when they think about citizenship is the right to vote. And this was true for the people that I write about. In 1840, for instance, a group of black activists said, we hold the elective franchise as a mighty lever for elevating in the scale of society any people. And without it, we are but nominally free. Another group said it in slightly simpler terms. They said the right to vote was indispensable to the protection, prosperity, and happiness of the citizen. But 19th century politics was complex, as it is now. Folks were fighting to address concerns beyond formal political access. So what I wanna do now is tell a story about a man named William Dixon. And this story reflects some of the breadth of black politics. Dixon's story helps us look beyond the vote. It offers a fuller sense of the strategies and objectives of African-American politics in the early 19th century. William Dixon's name emerged in the historical record after he was arrested in New York City on a spring morning in 1837. Dixon had left his home on the Bowery, headed to work, when a stranger grabbed him and brought him before a judge in City Hall. When he arrived in the courtroom, the stranger made his claim. This black man who called himself William Dixon was actually a fugitive slave, and he was actually named Jake. Allegedly, this man named Jake had run away from a Baltimore doctor named Walter Allender, and he had run away five years earlier, in 1832. So in court, the slave catcher, the man who had been employed to capture the fugitive slave, he referred to Dixon as Allender's Jake, and this is just the, the terminology of the time. This was a guy called Jake who allegedly belonged to Dr. Allender, so he was Allender's Jake. Authorities brought Dixon to a cell in the crumbling jail called Bridewell, and they held him there for a week. And then on the morning of April 12th, 1837, two sheriffs escorted him from Bridewell to City Hall for another hearing in front of Judge Richard Riker. 
Under the laws of New York, a single judge was empowered to decide whether an alleged fugitive would remain free or be sent into bondage. And Judge Riker had a particular rep reputation. He had a reputation as being a friend to slave owners. He had frequently allowed men to take alleged fugitives to the South. Riker was a critical part of the slave catching infrastructure in New York. So in front of Judge Riker, Dixon did what he could to fight. He, pro he protested his arrest and he insisted that his name was William Dixon. And he said this, it is hard, your honor. It is hard to be thus treated in this land of liberty. I'm an innocent man. I'm a free man. It is hard to be torn from my family and thrust into prison like a dog. I demand justice of your honor. So Riker heard Dixon's claims and he called for a recess to decide this man's fate. The sheriffs took Dixon by the arms to escort him back to jail. New York City Hall stands today as it did on that April afternoon in the middle of an eight acre park in lower Manhattan. And this is uh, one of my sort of favorite little research trips that I have a few pictures from. Uh, when I realized that City Hall now is the same building that it was in the 1830s, I went and took a tour uh, and got some, you know, what I think are some pretty good shots. So after his hearing on April 12th, the sheriff prepared to lead Dixon across the park to Bridewell. I did not take this picture. Flanking the captive, they walked down a grand staircase toward the building's main entrance. But as they ushered Dixon towards the doors of City Hall, they would have looked through these large windows that lined the front of the building, and they would have seen a massive crowd waiting outside. During the hearing, more than 1,000 African Americans had gathered on City Hall Plaza. Some sources say as many as 3,000 people were out there that day. The sheriffs were, for whatever reason, unconcerned about this. But as soon as they stepped outside, the crowd surged forward. Several people attacked the sheriffs with wooden clubs. There was a woman who was standing at the front of the crowd who pulled a knife from under her dress and handed it to William Dixon. So at first, Dixon wasn't sure what to do while these strangers were fighting for his freedom, but he overcame his shock and he started running. He ran west toward Broadway, and then he turned north to seek shelter in the busy city streets. The crowd continued to fight with authorities. One official ran outside to support the sheriffs, but according to one source, a strapping Negro wench grabbed him in a chokehold, and a group of young black men pretty well pummeled him and tore the coat completely off his back. So meanwhile, Dixon kept moving north on Broadway. A man on horseback tried to stop him, but Dixon's new escort, several black men armed with clubs, protected the fleeing prisoner. When he reached Duane Street, just a few blocks from City Hall, Dixon decided to take cover. He ducked into a coal cellar to wait out his pursuers. His freedom was short-lived. A few hours later, a witness tipped off authorities and they stormed into the cellar, seized William Dixon, and carted him back to Bridewell. And so briefly, the map you're looking at here, which is from a slightly later period, uh, the black dot is the location of City Hall, approximately. Uh, the green dot is where the Bridewell jail was, and the red dot is where Dixon decided to stop. So he didn't go all that far. The attempt to rescue William Dixon reflected an important thread in Black and anti-slavery politics of the period. The title for this talk today comes from the white abolitionist Henry Clark Wright. Wright was dismayed that alleged fugitives had to work harder to prove their cases than alleged slave owners did. Here, Wright said, is the great difficulty in all cases of runaways or citizens claimed as such. The whole burden of proof is thrown on the colored man. One black New Yorker argued that if the citizen of a free state was claimed as a slave, he or she should be entitled to a trial by jury in order to determine their status. Vocal black and white activists insisted that alleged fugitive slaves were citizens and that citizenship must protect free people from being sent into bondage. This rhetoric was intended to urge lawmakers to enact measures that would defend an individual's freedom. The reality, though, was that William Dixon was held captive by a legal system that had been designed to preserve black slavery. The U.S. Constitution empowered slave owners to reclaim fugitives who fled to another state. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 said slave owners uh, could cross state lines in order to pursue runaways. And theoretically, 
1793 Fugitive Slave Act also allowed slave owners to arrest free black Northerners who they accused of being fugitive slaves. The simple fact that enslaved people were so valuable meant that black Northerners lived in a precarious freedom. They might be seized mistakenly by slave catchers or maliciously by kidnappers. Kidnapping endangered all black Northerners and that helps to explain why so many people gathered on City Hall Plaza to try to rescue William Dixon. Black New Yorkers had a history of organizing to defend their freedom. In 1835, an interracial group of abolitionists established the New York Committee of Vigilance, or the NYCV. They called for new laws to protect free black people, and at the same time, they were helping known fugitive slaves who had come north looking for safety. They called this work practical abolition. They were doing concrete things to fight slavery and also to fight the dangerous implications of slavery for free people. Samuel Cornish, <clears throat> excuse me, was a leader in the NYCV, and he was the editor of The Colored American, which was an African-American newspaper that printed its first issue just a few weeks before Dixon's arrest. He might have thought that this was like particularly fortuitous timing. He ended up with a lot of dramatic stuff to cover in the first month or so that the paper was being printed. Like others in the Vigilance Committee, Cornish said alleged fugitives should have the protection of jury trials. But one of the most interesting things about his writing from this time is that Cornish was extremely critical of the violent attempt to liberate William Dixon. He said the crowd was nothing more than a multitude of illiterate people. So from Cornish's perspective, these folks weren't acting in a calculated way in pursuit of progress. Instead, they had become mere subjects of passion. There was some legitimacy to his concerns. NYCV lawyers were spearheading Dixon's case, and Cornish hoped that these lawyers could convince the judge to grant Dixon a jury trial. If that happened, then that decision might set a precedent that other lawmakers could follow. So Cornish had these high hopes for the legal potential of Dixon's case, and he doubted that if a mob rescued him outside of City Hall, that the same legal change would take place. But beyond his concerns about political tactics, Cornish was outraged that African-Americans had done something he felt was so uncivil. He was especially displeased that women had played prominent roles in the attempted rescue. He said those activist women had degraded themselves. And he added this, we begged their husbands to keep them at home for the time to come and find some better occupation for them. Cornish addressed this message to the thoughtless part of our colored citizens. He promoted particularly narrow ideas about who could do meaningful, productive black political work. Black women were often denied the chance to make their voices heard in black newspapers or in public meetings in the early 19th century. Men like Cornish had restrictive ideas about gender. They thought political activity wasn't appropriate for women. And so this is the one, one of the things that I actually find so fascinating about the attempted rescue of Dixon. Street politics provided a clear opportunity for black women to express their political ideas in public. I really like thinking about the woman who stood at the front of that crowd during the rescue, the woman who reached under her dress and pulled out a knife to give to William Dixon. She did that because she thought that she could help secure his freedom. So maybe she relished this opportunity to step outside of what some people thought was proper women's work. Or maybe she had done this several times before. Maybe she had, a long, maybe she had long ago rejected gendered ideas about what was acceptable behavior. It's tough to know this woman's activist history. We don't even know her name. But what we do know is important. She chose to take a critical role in William Dixon's rescue and none of the folks in the crowd stood in her way. Black women carved out opportunities to make their voices heard, despite some people's efforts to silence them. This woman's actions reflect some really important truths about the attempted rescue. African Americans believed Dixon deserved a fair hearing, and they were convinced that the legal structures that were in place would not provide it. The mob action was about defending Dixon's freedom but it was also about more than any single black person. Attacking sheriffs and judges in an effort to liberate an alleged fugitive was a protest against all of the institutions that stood inside of City Hall. 
It was a protest against the legal structures that imperiled all black people's freedom. Breaking the law was a critical form of black politics. Through their actions, the crowd outside of City Hall added their voices to those calling for a different legal order in the United States, a legal order that would protect black freedom as robustly as it defended slave owners' property rights. The attempted rescue of Dixon was an important part of the larger story of African Americans challenging unequal laws in an effort to claim rights through citizenship. Breaking laws was one way activists highlighted injustice and demanded change. So despite what Samuel Cornish wrote, these folks were far from thoughtless. This brings me to one of the ways I see my work connecting with contemporary black politics. Think back to the uprisings in Baltimore and Ferguson in 2014 and 2015 that took place after police officers killed unarmed black men. Many observers condemn these movements as violent, destructive, unruly, or unproductive. There are a couple of, of examples from this that I wanna point to, uh, both of which are from the Washington Post. Peaceful protest shifts focus back to death of Freddie Gray, as though violence wasn't an expression of outrage about Gray's killing. Or the headline of a column that begins from the premise, rioting makes no sense. A riot is only senseless to people who don't try to make sense of it. If we can see political thought and expression in the violent, unruly attempt to rescue William Dixon, we should try to do the same for violent, unruly forms of contemporary Black politics. Violence might be protest. Lawbreaking can be politics. Observers should ask thoughtful questions about the roots of particular forms of popular politics. Why might Black Americans choose certain avenues of political expression? What forms of Black thought are represented in collective public acts of lawbreaking. Making sense of these political acts might lead us to see the truth that certain legal structures need to be broken in order to bring people closer to racial justice. In the days after the failed rescue attempt, Dixon's trial continued. His counsel called a number of witnesses, including a white ship captain who testified that he had employed Dixon occasionally since 1831, and a black barber from Philadelphia who said that he had known Dixon as a free man for 15 years. Walter Allender, again, this is Dixon's alleged owner, had to prove a difficult case. The slave called Jake had allegedly run away in 1832. So none of his witnesses could claim to have seen the man for at least five years. They then had to prove that after all that time, they could identify one out of the 20,000 free and enslaved African-Americans who lived in Baltimore. Judge Riker refused to deliver a prompt decision in the case. He left Dixon to sit in the cell for three months. Perhaps he spent that time anxious that his decision might lead to more violence on the steps of City Hall. But finally, in July 1837, Riker granted a writ that allowed Dixon to go free on bail. Under the terms of this writ, Dixon would have to return to court if the judge called him, but in any subsequent hearings, a jury would determine his fate. This writ allowed Dixon to return to his life in New York, and it offered an important new layer of legal protection against enslavement. His freedom was tenuous, but all the same, he would live free of a slave owner's control. It seemed that Samuel Cornish and William Dixon and the NYCV lawyers had been right to obey the law in seeking protections for black freedom. Judge Riker responded favorably to their arguments and the case could potentially set a valuable precedent that could protect other alleged fugitives in the time to come. In Dixon's story, we can see how people who were denied formal political rights were able to insert their voices and ideas into the spaces where laws were being made. In one sense, my book is all about stories like this. It's about free African-Americans insisting that they should have a voice in the lawmaking process and finding creative ways to push their way in. In New York, Black people learn the law, and they also risk their lives in defense of one another. These were two of the many ways they made themselves heard. Most of the Black folks in the crowd that rescued William Dixon wouldn't have been able to vote, so they figured out another way to express their concerns. Before I wrap up, 
there's a little epilogue to Dixon's story that I'd like to share. And it offers another angle on the many ways Black people pursue justice and the kinds of politics I explore in my book. After he was released from jail, William Dixon lived in a state of anxiety. He could still be called back to court, or he might be arrested again, or he might be kidnapped. His daily life was a tense experience. And perhaps no single encounter was more frightening than a chance meeting with a runaway slave from Maryland. In a second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, Frederick Douglass described the morning he arrived in New York City in 1839, disembarking from a train just after he escaped slavery in Baltimore. So this is a later portrait of Douglass, but I think it's one that, you know, in the facial expression might convey some of his emotions in this moment. Douglass was lost and lonely. He was wandering the streets of lower Manhattan. And so he felt overjoyed when he bumped into a black man he remembered from Baltimore, a man he recognized as Allender's Jake. I knew Jake well, Douglas wrote. He had heard that Dr. Allender had sent slave catchers after the runaway, but Douglas was glad to see that Jake seemed to be thriving in freedom. As you might imagine, Jake was less than pleased to run into this old friend. He announced to Douglas, I am William Dixon in New York, and he quickly walked away, leaving the more recent runaway alone in an unfamiliar city. Given what Douglas wrote about this encounter, it's worth considering a few more questions about William Dixon's story. Who knew the truth of Allender's Jake? The black New Yorkers who tried to rescue him understood how difficult it was for any African-American to secure freedom through the law. Regardless of whether they knew Dixon was Jake, they knew there were limits to the justice available to him, and they took steps to challenge that reality. Did the NYCV lawyers know that they were defending a fugitive? If they did, then Dixon and his defense team broke the law repeatedly, brazenly, from inside of New York City Hall. Their law breaking helped move toward a precedent that might create new legal protections for black freedom. The lawyers recruited witnesses, black and white, who were willing to lie in court in an effort to protect African Americans. One way we might think about this is that the figure of William Dixon stood at the center of a high stakes test case. For all his condemnation of the attempted rescue, it seems likely that Samuel Cornish, who again was a leader in the Vigilance Committee, also knew the truth about Dixon. In fact, he might've been so angry about the city hall mob precisely because of what he knew. Perhaps because he knew all the work that had gone into creating and defending William Dixon, he was exasperated that a popular protest might disrupt a case that had so much potential. It seems that the legal case of the runaway slave Jake was in effect a series of acts of law breaking that took place both in and outside of City Hall. Finally, why did this man lie so ardently about his freedom? And why did he seem to think it would work? Maybe this was a simple choice for a person who was desperate to be free. William Dixon was a character a performance of freedom and acted in the courtroom and on the streets. It was a skillful performance, a high wire act of law breaking. His story shows us how well black people understood the law. It shows us how effectively they manipulated and moved through legal structures, making transformative claims about citizenship, rights, and justice. In the 1830s, African-Americans deftly navigated the legal landscape of New York working in print, in court, and in the streets to transform a fugitive slave called Allender's Jake into a free man named William Dixon. So thank you guys for your time. Uh, I look forward to uh, maybe hearing some questions that um, we might discuss. Thank you so much, Christopher. That was really incredible. Uh, this is an incredible Thanks. presentation. Um, we have some questions here, and if you have a question, please ask it in the Ask a Question feature below, and I'll read them out. Um, Tiffany asks, how should we be thinking about what terms to use for activism? You use mob and protest in one instance. For other yeah. points in history, some use riots, while others use uprisings. How yeah. do these labels elevate or hinder Black voices in activism? And thinking about Patterson's concept of social death, is breaking the law 
for the purpose of gaining rights in form of responding being placed outside of the law. Can you repeat that last line again? It's breaking the law. Um, yeah, and thinking about Patterson's concept of social death is mm -hmm. breaking the law for the purpose of gaining rights, a form of responding, being placed outside of the law. Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll take that last piece first. Uh, absolutely. Uh, black folks broke the law in the 19th century, and I think that black folks in some cases break the law today in protest activities uh, precisely because they feel like they don't have a formal voice. They don't have formal access in the ways that other groups of people and other individuals do. Um, so placing people outside of the law uh, might lead them to uh, decide that law breaking is uh, the most fruitful of political tactics. And it's important that we think about that, that we wonder about the circumstances that lead people to pursue law breaking as politics, right? And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do uh, in this talk. I think that the, the first part of the question about the language is also really interesting. Um, I use the term mob, I didn't, I didn't explain this here, but I use the term mob in a, um, a way that I think is informed by some of the writing on uh, popular politics among black and white folks in the early 19th century. Mobbing was uh, a kind of political work that people did, and it was understood as a way that people could come together and um, express their voices in public, make themselves heard. And so this is something that's happening at least as early as the 1760s with protests against the Stamp Act. People are rioting, people are mob mobbing, and they're, under, they're understanding that these are valuable ways to uh, speak their minds, right? And this continues into the 19th century. And so um, I, think that, I think that part of your question might be like, does calling this a riot or does calling this a mob rather than calling it an uprising or a protest does different language sort of devalue uh, a particular kind of action? Uh, and I think that in a lot of people's minds, it does. You know, a riot doesn't make sense to people, right? But if we think about a riot in terms of like, not what the language to describe it is, but what are the people actually trying to do? What is it that brings the people to that point? I think that we can sort of do some really thoughtful work about the politics of a riot or an uprising regardless of the actual noun that we give to it. But I do, I think I take the point that um, it's important to be careful about how we describe these things um, because some people devalue something because of the name that one gives to it. Okay. We have a <clears throat> question from Rafi. You mentioned barring blacks from militias and voting. Mm -hmm. Justice Thomas agrees this link is pivotal. He reads 19th century black construction of judicial personhood as centered around guns, access to guns, with sine qua non requirement for the movement of blacks from slavery to being able to assert equal citizenship. And hence, gun deregulation is the only way for black self protection against white violence, whether private or public. Hmm. Yet it can also facilitate NYC like <coughs> action. Would you agree? Sorry, it can also facilitate the last. Uh, NYCV like action, would you agree? So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the question about gun rights in, in black history is really, uh, really complex. Um, there are, are, you know, some of the earliest laws that we have from colonial America are laws that restricted. So in, in 1640, I believe, uh, Virginia passed a law that said all persons except Negroes would be given guns. And so this is, they're doing this in Virginia because they're concerned about Native Americans. And so they think that they need a really well-armed society, but no black people are allowed to have guns in this, in this moment, right? So there's a long, long history of black people being restricted from having weapons and of black people uh, in both slavery and freedom well into the 19th and early 20th century, mid 20th century, uh, using guns and gun rights as a way to defend themselves and their property, right? Uh, the history in the mid 20th century of somebody like Robert Williams, who is uh, really passionately advocating for black gun ownership as a means to self-defense in the 1950s in North Carolina. That's really important. Um, at the same time, I think that when we recognize that and when we recognize the ways that black people have used gun ownership effectively for their own defense, it's really important that we don't obscure the ways in which gun ownership 
can lead to and does continue to lead to uh, killings of black people, right? And, and I'm thinking about uh, policies like stand your ground laws in a place like Florida, right? That enable someone to kill Trayvon Martin and to say that what they're doing is self-defense, right? So not only does a person uh, have the tool to kill another person, but a person has legal justification for that killing because of a set of policies that are put in place and are rooted in this deep national investment in guns as the tool to self-defense, right? And so I, um, there's, there's no simple way to say like, I, I, I feel like the, the question is kind of leading to like, guns are good for black folks. And it's like, yeah, in some cases they have been, right? But in a lot of other cases, they're, they're harmful. Uh, and it's really important that, that we recognize both of those pieces of that. Um, thank you for the question. Okay. We have a question from Naomi and David. Can you see parallels between the Dixon case and the late 20th century tension between Blacks and AACP Legal Defense Fund? Who wanted to use the courts and others who wanted more confrontational politics on the street, SNCC? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I think this is a you know, there are, there are ways to make uh, these kinds of, to draw these kinds of contrasts across uh, two centuries or more of black history. Um, and as much as I'm contrasting, I, I, I give this talk and I, I think about it a little bit and I know that Sam Cornish comes across as a villain in some ways. Um, and in some ways he is, like he said some really nasty things about women and it's important that we recognize that. Um, but I, I don't, I think that what's, al what's also really striking is that is recognizing that Cornish and, uh, for instance, the woman who has the knife under her dress, they're working toward the same end. They're just choosing different approaches to it, right? Uh, and the same thing might be the case with groups like the Legal Defense Fund uh, and SNCC, right? People have the same goals in mind, broadly, right? Racial justice. Uh, and it's I think that it's as important as it is to distinguish between the two tactics that they're, or the two tracks that they're taking, it's also really critical that we recognize that common ground um, and that we think about um, commonalities in black politics that, that uh, I guess, that are overarching over tactical differences. Um, so yeah, there's definitely parallels, um, but I think it's, it's really important to emphasize the, the connections um, in between people who take different approaches to political change. Okay, and if you have a question, please go to the Ask a Question feature below. Um, we have one from Deb. She wants to know where Dixon eventually lived after all everything. We don't know, uh, unfortunately, or I should, say, I should say, I don't know. Um, there, is, there are records from the NYCV that say that uh, there was this little, in between the time when he got out of jail and when he bumped into Douglas, there's this little moment where he is in Canada. And there are records that say they, there's all this um, really very lightly coded language where they say something like um, $15 has been allocated to this person for assisting a particular stranger in a move to Canada uh, or $13 for housing a particular stranger after his return from Canada, right? Um, and so there, there are ways in which it's, <clears throat> it's clear that Dixon goes to Canada and then decides that he can come back, but he's worried for a little bit. Um, but after this sort of run in with Douglas, as far as I can tell, he disappears from the record. In some ways, that's probably exactly what Dixon wanted, um, that sort of anonymity. Uh, but it's also really entirely possible that he decided to go to Canada, which um, at this point, um, the British Empire had been moving toward abolishing slavery. And so Canada is a space that was available for black folks who were able to go there and were willing to leave the country in which they had been born. Uh, it was a space where they could go and feel secure that slave catchers weren't gonna be able to come get them. Uh, there wasn't any law that allowed a slave catcher to go to Canada uh, to capture a fugitive slave. So um, short answer is we don't know, but uh, I think that's part of what's interesting about it. 
Okay. Uh, Alice would like to know whether the infamous New York City prison is named after Judge Riker. I, sh I should know that. I, I don't know. I want to suggest just because it's, a, it's not a particularly common name that there's got to be some kind of connection, but um, I want to ask you not to quote me on that because I, I just don't know for certain. And I, I kind of want to try to do a little quick Google, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but, you know, again, there are interesting connections in terms of the reputation Riker had for his treatment of black folks and um, the realities of Rikers Island as a, as a jail. So thanks for that. Okay, we have a question from Bruce. The 15th Amendment starts with the rights of citizens. So, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So it assumes that someone is a citizen. Is there any backstory to this language? Uh, yeah, the, broadly what's happening in the 15th Amendment is building on the 14th Amendment, which uh, is the first moment, so enacted in, uh, ratified in 1868, is this first moment in the Constitution where citizenship is being defined. Citizenship is a birthright based on the 14th Amendment and citizenship uh, protects or, or provides people with uh, equal access to, or, or uh, what's the, equal protection of laws uh, is the language, right? And so the 14th Amendment lays out uh, a federal definition for citizen status and lays out a, a set of parameters that allow a person to attain that status. And it's really designed to, uh, declare and to solidify a legal reality in which formerly enslaved people freed during the Civil War are citizens. Uh, and so the 15th Amendment is building on that uh, and trying to um, connect the right to vote to uh, citizenship as a status. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a, a, a process that is um, not sort of neatly perfect, right? I think it's, it's interesting that I think it's interesting and important that these are separate amendments, right? That the law that makes people citizens is not the same law that uh, entitles them to the right to vote. And there are pieces of the 14th Amendment that um, black folks in the late 1860s before the 15th Amendment came along that they felt were essentially saying that citizenship does not necessarily mean that a person has the right to vote. And so people after the 14th Amendment was enacted were upset that it didn't protect uh, elector or uh, the elective, elector, elective, electoral franchise is the phrase that I want. Um, and essentially saying we need more than this. And the 15th Amendment is um, sort of adding on to some of the insufficiencies uh, of the 14th Amendment. We have another question from Tiffany. How does the respectability politics movement around the 1920s compare with the street mobs in your case. Can you situate this with the Black Lives Matter movement? She says, of course, media and technology are a factor. What is the role of a historian to ensure informed interpretations occur? Also super curious to learn about what uh, sources you used. Uh, all right, <laughs> there's a lot. Uh, so sources, I, I guess I'll say, um, some of the things that I pulled up, a, a lot of the sources that I use actually are from black newspapers and abolitionist newspapers. And I think that, I, I mean, so many of these things are digitized. It's, it's incredible. Uh, there's this website that um, it's called Accessible Archives. And I actually, I think a lot of libraries, maybe ac mostly academic libraries uh, have access to it. Uh, and it collects uh, digitized versions and even transcripts of uh, most of the major black newspapers that were published in the antebellum period from the, about the 1820s through the end of the Civil War. Uh, so there's a, a, there's a fascinating, fascinating set of records there. Um, the question about uh, historians' responsibility, I think that, um, I, I, I definitely think that it's my job to not just make arguments and, and tell stories, but to encourage people to ask different kinds of questions than they might without uh, thinking about the past, right? And so that's part of what I want to do today is not just to say like, oh yeah, like violence is great. Violence is always politics. But to say, hey, when someone sees something happen, instead of saying, I don't like this thing, ask questions about where it comes from. Ask questions about the purposes or the projects of that particular 
uh, kind of political action, right? And so um, I guess I would say my, I feel like my responsibility is to encourage people to think critically about the things that they see happening around them. Um, the, I, I, I guess in terms of like Black Lives Matter, I think the, one of the connections that I think your question is pointing toward is this really important reality that technology has facilitated um, all sorts of uh, movements in the contemporary context. And, you know, in a lot of ways, the newspapers and things that uh, Samuel Cornish is writing in were kind of the cutting edge technology that was doing the same thing. Um, black newspapers were fostering black intellectual community uh, in a way that something like Twitter can uh, and, and does uh, today. Uh, I can't remember what the first part of the question was. It's a, uh... How does respectability politics? Uh, yeah, respectability, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess I would, I would try to, to say in short, I think that um, the respectability politics of the 19, of the early 20th century are actually uh, building on and echoing a lot of the respectability politics of uh, the early 19th century. And so, what this is, is basically this idea that uh, black folks have to act a particular way, that they have to look a particular way, uh, that behavior is the best way for them to prove that they deserve equality, right? Uh, and so this is sort of in line with what Cornish is doing in condemning the mob. He's saying that, you know, if you guys would just be more orderly, if you would follow the rules, then you might prove that you are entitled to the right to trial by jury, right? And, and this is not just a thing that happens in in this moment, right? Uh, respectability politics is all over my book. Um, there's so much investment in temperance and in uh, this urgency, this urgent call for black people to be like frugal, to not waste their money, uh, to not go to bars and parties and dances and whatever that might look like. Um, yeah, there, there is a lot of this feeling among vocal black activists, folks like Cornish who are publishing newspapers, that other people need to just behave themselves and that that will be an important part of their um, progress toward justice or equality. And just a reminder, uh, if you guys click the green button there, you can purchase Christopher's book. I encourage all of you guys to do that. Uh, we have a question from Richard. Professor Bonner, though you are a historian and focus on the past, could you please describe an ideal future for our country that would address and move us beyond the racial injustice you have described in this book? And what could citizens do to bring about that vision of our country? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is something I think about. Um, I, I appreciate you saying that I'm a historian. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't study this, so I know that there are aspects of this that I, you know, I'm not as informed about as I would like to be. Um, I guess I, one way that I've been thinking, I've been thinking about the future uh, in relation to the ways that people are responding right now to COVID-19 and to concerns about um, epidemic outbreak, right? I think that there are really powerful possibilities in this response. The fact that, you know, I'm, I'm in my house, uh, my house is comfortable, it's, it's nice, it's fine, of course, I would like to be outside more. I would like to see my friends. But one of the things that we're being urged to do and that I think I think people are doing pretty well about is sacrificing little things that they might want that might make their lives a little bit easier or a little bit more fun for the common good. Giving up a little something for vulnerable people, right? Uh, and so I think that one of the one of the ways that I, I think about the future and an, and an ideal future is one in which more and more people are prepared to give up a little bit in order to make sure that fewer and fewer people don't have enough. And if we're moving in that direction, I think we're moving in a good direction, right? One of the other things that I think is really important though is not just like uh, care, which is important and love, which is important, right? Like it's it, it's really important that I have decided that other people's health is important enough to me that I'm not going to go out there, right? But I also think that there are really important ways in which we don't just need to care about people, but we need to 
put into power people who want to make the government compel others who don't care to not be able to take advantage of vulnerable people, right? So I guess a, a shorter way to say that is like, individual care for other people is not enough. I think that policy and power needs to be moved to protect and to defend the interests of the vulnerable. Um, so this combination of like love and power, I think is, is uh, important for a future that I would think would be better than the present. Okay, Mona asks, is there much more historical data about other black women who stepped forward in such an obvious way? Uh, yeah, so, so there's, one way to think about that is that there's, there's historical data about black women who, who actually did make their voices heard in newspapers and in public meetings and uh, in other spaces, even as people like Samuel Cornish were trying to push them out. One of the, one of the most prominent um, examples of this is, is uh, a woman named, one of the, yeah, uh, prominent is probably the right way to describe her, a woman named Mariah Stewart, and it's Mariah but spelled like Maria Stewart. Uh, and in the early 1830s, she is able to stand up and give a speech um, at a black public meeting and basically to uh, denounce the sort of inaction of all of these men who are talking back and forth, but not really getting a lot done, right? And so Mariah Stewart is this woman who um, pushes her way in, literally, but does so in the formal spaces of black politics, right? Um, and there's also, there's, there's all sorts of like really creative ways that um, black women engaged in politics and expressed themselves politically. Uh, one of the things that, that's, um, one of the things that I'm thinking about that's pretty interesting is all of the work that black women did. One of my colleagues at Maryland, Psyche Williams Forsen, has done some work on this. There's, there is a lot of sort of um, hidden history of all of the work that black women did to make possible black men's activism, right? So even in spaces where black men are going to meetings and uh, deciding that they're gonna be the ones who are able to speak, right? Black women would set up the meetings. Black women would provide these men with places to stay. Black women would uh, feed these men, right? Uh, and that's a way to think about the kinds of political choices that black women were making, right? Doing work, sacrificing parts of themselves uh, in the interest of promoting black politics, right? And another way to think about what black women did is, is by thinking about like, being an activist now, as it was in the, in the 1830s and 40s, wasn't a really well-paying position, right? And so think about somebody like Frederick Douglass, who uh, basically in the early 1840s, late 1830s, early 1840s, when he's first working as an abolitionist, is sort of traveling the country, not making a lot of money. He hasn't published the narrative yet. Uh, he needs support. And his wife, Anna Murray, Anna Murray Douglas, uh, was doing work as a housekeeper and basically supporting him, right? Uh, and so her labor was, I, I wanna say her labor was critical for black politics. And, and a, a, maybe a simpler way to say that is her labor was black politics, right? Anna Murray made it possible for Frederick Douglass to work as an abolitionist, right? And, and even before he's working as an abolitionist, Anna Murray and Frederick Douglass meet, at least Frederick Bailey at this point, they meet in Baltimore and they fall in love. Anna Murray was free in Baltimore. She gave him money to buy a sailor's uniform. She connected him with, uh, she gave him money to buy a train ticket too. And she connected him with a free black sailor who gave Douglass his own travel papers that allowed Douglass, all these three things, the uniform, the money and the papers allowed Douglas to get on a train from Baltimore to New York, where he then went and met Jake or William Dixon, right? So like, there is no good story about someone like Douglas that doesn't include Anna Murray and all the work that she did to make that possible. <clears throat> a question from Nick Nico. In your research for Remaking the Republic, it sounds like you looked at many different types of records. What was something that surprised you in these sources? Huh. Um, 
Well, I mean, reading My Bond and My Freedom and finding out that Douglas knew Jake was a surprise. Like I didn't, I didn't know that Dixon was actually a fugitive slave until I found this uh, piece in, in Douglas, right? So that's one way to think about it. Um, huh, what surprised me? I guess I would say one of the things that surprised me is sort of <clears throat> how much posturing went on in some of these meetings. There's this, there's this quotation, I'm not sure if I'm gonna get it right. There's a quotation that I really like where um, it's, a, it's a meeting of black abolitionists and they're talking about um, how much they hate slavery and how much they wish they could do something more about it. And one of, one of the guys says, I wish I had a spear long enough to transfix all of the slaveholders at once. And there's this, there's, and, and then like some of the other guys are like, uh, <clears throat> you know, you talk a big game, but, and, and one of the response quotations is, uh, when the shooting time comes, you will be nowhere to be found. And so there's this really interesting, like hyper-masculine um, dueling that's going on in some of these conversations, right? And it's really important for people to be seen as advocating a particular kind of politics. Uh, and in, 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 this, in these cases, a particularly masculine and violent kind of politics, right? Like, it's like, who hates slavery more and who's willing to fight slavery most passionately? Um, so that, you know, it's, it, I guess what's interesting is that it's a kind of, you know, it, it seems almost kind of petty, but I think that, you know, it's easy for me to, to it, it was easy for me in, in, in the research process to maybe forget some of the humanity of these folks. And that kind of stuff would really highlight it, right? Like, um, they're, they're just like guys, like talking trash in, in some ways. And, and it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of funny to, to see them in that way. So unfortunately we only have time for one more. Um, this comes from Anna. She wants to know, what are you working on next? Uh, great question. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm working on a project that is uh, built around another story. It's built around a story of this guy called Moses Grandy, who um, was enslaved in northeastern North Carolina and southeastern northeastern yeah northeastern North Carolina, southeastern Virginia in the early 1800s. Uh, and Grandy has skills. He was a, a boat navigator and he was able to make money. And so he started making these arrangements with his owner to try to purchase his freedom. And several times, Grandy pays his owner. Grandy earns the money, pays his owner, and tries to buy his freedom. And the owner takes the money and sells Grandy to another slave owner. Uh, and so I'm really interested in um, thinking about Grandy as a way to understand you know, like we know and, and historians have, have argued really effectively in recent years that slavery was a capitalist institution, that it was driven by profit, right? Uh, and one of the things that I wanna think about with Grandy's story is to think more about how the institution of slavery as a capitalist system uh, filtered into the lives of actual individual people and how someone like Grandy came to understand the way the economic system worked and in a similar way to the way I'm talking about like the ways black folks read the law and tried to manipulate it, right? How did Grandy work to try to manipulate the economic system of slavery to his advantage? Um, and in some cases to his, uh, in, in, in several cases to his disadvantage, right? So um, yeah, I'm interested in like buying freedom and how it happened and what it meant for black folks. Okay. Thank you so much, Christopher, for being with us today. This was yeah. an amazing talk. Yeah. Um, for any of you who haven't purchased it yet, please click the green button to purchase Remaking the Republic from Politics and Prose. And you can follow us by clicking the follow button uh, above. And uh, let's all thank Christopher again for uh, that excellent presentation. Yeah, thank you. And thank you guys for the questions. They were really terrific. So uh, I appreciate the time. Okay. So long, everyone. Thanks. Bye. All good. <laughs>
still stopping. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. I don't know why. <laughs> no worries. But you're good. <laughs> All right. I really want to find out about Rikers Island. Hmm. No, 